I'd like to just begin with uh, the scripture reading, and then after I complete the scripture reading, I will then uh, open with a prayer, and then I will speak. This is a homily on, inspired by, um, the third epistle of John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, Beloved, I'm praying that everything around you is made prosperous and that you may be in good health in the same way that your soul prospers. I was overjoyed when our siblings arrived and were witnesses to you being in the truth, just as you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are living according to the truth. Beloved, you act faithfully in whatever work you do for our siblings, even though they are strangers. Before the entire assembly, they gave testimony to your love. You will do well to send them out in a way that honors God, because they went out on behalf of the name without accepting any support from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to help people like this so that we can be co-workers with the truth. I wrote something to the assembly, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, doesn't welcome us. Because of this, if I come, I will bring up what he has done, making unjustified and wicked accusations against us. And not being content with these things, he not only refuses to welcome our siblings, but prevents those who wish. And even throwing them out of the assembled fellowship. Beloved, do not imitate, don't mimic the wicked but the good. Whoever practices what is good belongs to God. Whoever practices what is evil has not seen God. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius, even the truth itself. We also speak highly of him, and you know what we say is true. I have a lot to say to you, but I would rather not write to you with ink and pen. I hope to see you soon, and we will speak face to face. Peace be with you. Your friends here greet you. Greet our friends there by name. Let us pray. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in, by you. My mouth stretches wide before my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Let not arrogance come from my mouth, for you are a God of knowledge, and by you actions are weighed. You raise up the poor from the dust and lift the needy from ashes. May you hide me behind thy cross and mediate a word for your people. Your people are listening. Amen. There's an African proverb that was popularized by and brought into Main Street uh, parlance by then First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, she published a book called It Takes a Village. The full adage, it takes a village to raise a child, challenges notions of individuality and self-determination. This adage, this proverb attempts to articulate a corporate vision of community a corporate vision of well-being that brings diverse segments of a populace into organic cooperation. And in the back of my mind, it takes a village. It takes a village. It takes a village. It's in the back of my mind as I read and hypothesized and envisioned this third epistle of John. This third epistle to which the unnamed elder writes intently to a protege. Uh, co-worker named Gaius. Today's scripture comes from an unlikely and seldom mind source. This third epistle of John is a resistant text. I describe it as such because it, it is highly resistant 
to many of our traditional values, to traditional desires to locate, to refine, to verify, to constrain, and to bound. This text resists our exegetical, biblical control. It's largely unattested until after the third century, yet much of the language resembles the first and second epistles of John and the Gospel of John. It can't even attest to a strong tradition of scholarship. We don't even have reliable traditions about who wrote it, which I wouldn't accept in any of your exegetical papers anyway. <laughs> we can't even think if we assume, which we're not going to assume, that it's John that wrote this third epistle, which John? John the Elder, John the Apostle, John of John who? How about this? We can't even be sure the third epistle of John was written after the Gospel of John, 1 John, or 2 John. Yes, it's the third epistle of John because it's the shortest. It's the shortest work in the entire New Testament. But what if it was written first? What if this epistle to Gaius actually precedes the gospel as we know it? What if the gospel epistle to Gaius precedes the letter to the elect lady? Or the first epistle that engages in both and testifies that, oh, what I have seen, what I have heard, what I have felt with my own eyes. What if the third epistle is the oldest of these Johannine traditions? It resists our desire to know what is true and therefore expound what it says and what it means. This test text is resistant. It is an enigma of sorts, and it's somewhat confounding, and at the same time, that means it's somewhat freeing. It liberates us to envision and imagine, to engage and consider, to reflect, to listen, and to ponder. And so I want to suggest that within all the spheres of uncertainty and anonymity, at the heart of 3rd John are issues of community and hospitality, are issues of division. At the heart of 3rd John is a challenge to that old African proverb, it takes a village. It is within this context that I think 3rd John offers as a useful springboard to consider our own locations, our own contexts, our own envisioned villages and communities, denominations that are at division and schism, institutions that are in division and schism, nation states and congresses that are in division and schism. Third John shatters attempts at Christian primitivism. Are you familiar with the ideal image of the original church, that the church of the New Testament was perfect? The church of the New Testament, so close, by proximity with Christ, was ideal, and everything in our power needs to do what? Needs to go back and reclaim the ideal and perfect church where the elder was unwelcome. We need to go back and resurrect and live into our being as the original primitive prox, the closest church to Jesus. Because those that were with Jesus initially, they had it right, they had it figured out. And honestly, we're doing a pretty good job of this Christian primitivism. We do kick out our siblings. We do hear words from the elder and reject it and say that they are unwelcome. 
we're actually doing a bang-up job of Christian primitivism. Or so says Third John. But that's not how I want to en envision Third John for the time I have with you. I honestly want to think about Third John not as something that is an answer. Third John is not telling us how we're going to make it. Third John is not telling us what we need to believe. Third John does not mention Jesus or Christ. Third John is not concerned with theological beliefs like Second John is. But here in Third John, the issue deals with how do we accept and welcome our siblings in the way? And so what 3 John does for us is not give us answers, but it gives us an analogy. It says, guess what? We've been here before. 3 John reminds us that in experiences of strife, we're not alone. In our moments of exclusion and acceptance, we're not the first. When we exist among community discord and the fellowship is fractured, that we, it reminds us that we walk alongside those before us, we walk alongside those that are with us, and we walk alongside those that are yet to come after us. Third John is a text that reminds us we've been there before. So as we go towards a lived reality that's mediated by a true calling that we experience vividly, our vocational, our spiritual calls, and resp we respond to this vivid, Reality, when the spirit touches and moves and motivates, we respond to a real truth. This real, vivid truth, however, is only mediated amidst the shadows of our daily struggles. This real, vivid truth is only articulated and rationalized and communicated via the systems of hegemony and identity in which we exist. Third John reminds us that we're not alone. And so I would like to recall you and just bring you and just say that there was a time in his, the history of Western civilization when people were moved, they responded to this truth, this spirit, that, was, that, that God was manifested in freedom and liberty. There was a time in the history of Western civilization where the notions that, that the constraints of hegemonic monarchies and flippant tyrants were not ordained by God. No, they were not ordained by God. They didn't even reflect the reality of a hegemonic hierarchical God. No, there was a time in Western civilization when individuals believed in individual liberty and the democratic organization of reason, rationalized, liberated consciousness, they believed that this enlightenment was the best way to pursue the divine spirit of liberty. There was a time, uh, philosophers might say, a zeitgeist was in the air that urged the consciousness of humanity towards its full freedom. And now the spirit moved and governments reformed and Christianity reformed and exhaled expressions of revival. People envisioned communities. They sought to drive us to the promised land, to freedom. They espoused truths as we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There was a spirit in the air. This notion of truth was driving civilization. Yet in the shadows of hegemony, in the shadows of identity, in the shadows of our lives, there were perversions in their vision of liberty. Men did not mean human. Men did not even mean hued men. Men meant white male. 
The freedom that was envisioned actually depended upon the displaced and bounded native and the shackled African. It took a village, but the village necessitated violence and violated the humanity and sanctity of the other. Beloved, don't imitate, do not mimic the wicked, but the good. Whoever practices what is good belongs to God. Whoever practices what is evil has not seen God. Yet in the midst, there were some churches that saw value in their pigmented neighbors. One such church, St. George's of Philadelphia, exploited their value. They saw value not in their souls, but in their bank accounts and resources. So they were worshiping together, and yes, they could become members of the church, but they were valued for their value. And as many freed blacks of Philadelphia contributed and financially backed St. George's, their renovation and expansion, these black members' values were accepted, and then they were excluded. The congregation's vision of village sought to relegate their huge pigmented siblings in Christ to the balcony, all the way to the point that they would drag members by force from their knees as they prayed in spaces reserved for the holy and holy human. These Africans were neither holy or fully and holy human in their village vision. Again, this community of faith and spirit envisioned a community of village that condensed boundaries. Beloved, don't imitate. Do not mimic the wicked, but the good. Whoever practices what is good belongs to God. Whoever practices what is evil has not seen God. But this did not constrain the spirit, because yet again we appreciate how these individuals of African descent would not be forced into the models of victimhood. They would not be denied their own vision, and so the Free African Society was formed, and this led to the formation of Bethel United, Bethel Methodist Episcopal Church, and that's how this movement that led to the AME Church would touch the lives of countless Africans living in America, freeing and emancipating, sharing and serving. St. George's wasn't ready. They wanted the Free African Society property, but they said no. They sued, and they won. And this movement, this movement towards freedom, touched the lives of so many that one woman plagued by suicidal thoughts of depression, she was hopeless, and she was fed. Her inner humanity was fed by this church. This Jarena Lee experienced the spirit of truth. It is within this community that she experienced the truth. Yet the village could not envision her as capable of hearing the voice of God. And so even the prophet Richard Allen distorted her vision with a skewed understanding of the truth. He interpreted for her a reality that sought to snuff out God's life, snuff out God's world on her life. Beloved, don't imitate the wicked but the good. Whoever practices what is good belongs to God. Whoever practices what is evil has not seen God. Time after time, we see this notion of village, this notion of community, the idea of freedom, sustenance, and well-being is entrapped in interpretations and models that mimic the hegemonic power structures of the world. While we champion the idea that it takes a village, who pauses to consider the ideologies and models on which, upon which we build village upon which we build community. It may take a village, but what happens when our visions of village violently violate the humanity and the indwelling spirit within the people of God? And it is within this context I call all of us here right now to continue to think about notions of family, definitions of family, notions of nation, definitions of nation, notions of empire, definitions of empire, notions of diaspora, definitions of diaspora. I think about competing notions of community, and I even think about 3 John. We don't know where 3 John was written. And it's intriguing how 
in all of its ambiguity and obscurity, this notion of truth and our translators' preconceived notions of truth direct our readings and how the text shows up. Frequently, within 3 John, the author says, by the name, if you check many of our translations, it says, in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, by the name, directly following this notion of God. Frequently, we'll see this notion of you did well to them even though they are strangers or foreigners. Frequently, we see this notion of ethnicon or the Gentile-ish. <laughs> Described as pagan or non-believer. Because our notions and constructions of what this author viewed as true and truth are predicated on theological boundaries. When 3 John does not explicitly tell us or invite us to think specifically and solely theologically, it is in the 3 John that the author deviates from traditional formula and says, no, I am praying for you that in all things you are prosperous, successful, and healthy, healthy, just as it is with your soul, your person, your being, your suke. In 3 John, it is not pie-in-the-sky theology. The author, the elder, says, I am praying for your material location. I am praying for your health and well-being. I am praying that what is manifested in a blessed walk, the health of your soul may sometime begin to reflect the experiences that you have within society. We have to be careful not to confine our notions of village within our presumed notions of power. And so, as we move, I would like us to think about the words of 3 John as a witness, a testimony, a memorialization of a moment of family failure. The author's insistence on simply identifying as an elder is a plea for identity and connectedness with Gaius. The world provides an alternative model. The world is constantly tempting and inviting us to model and mimic its understandings of power. And I invite us to think of this notion of truth not as a creedal reality, not as belief in the solely in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but this truth this truth that mediates how we love, this truth that mediates how we speak, this truth that mediates how we experience, this truth that mediates how we testify, this truth that mediates how we go to our neighbor, this truth that mediates how we welcome our neighbor, this truth that mediates our articulation of that vivid spirit that we experience. Is that thing. It's that goodness that helps us discern the spaces of God. 
I want us to invite, I want to invite us to move in how we think about truth. I want us to remember that we're not alone because we've been here before. Yes, 45 is very different than other times, but we've been here before. And I'd like you to remind you that the elder was not alone. The elder spoke of siblings. The elder spoke of Demetrius. The elder spoke and recalled the activity of Gaius. Diatrophies. Don't worry. I'll handle that when I get there. If I get there. You don't mimic what's bad. You model yourself after what's good. And so, just like we have this model, we don't know what to do, but we know it's doable. And so we can even think about this horror story that I started with, that Richard Allen tried to thwart the spirit of Jarena Lee. But I'll, let me close with the words of Jarena Lee. Oh, how careful ought we to be lest through our bylaws of church government and discipline we bring into disrepute even the word of life. For as unseemly as it may appear nowadays for a woman to preach, it should be remembered that nothing is impossible with God. And why should it be thought impossible, heterodox, or improper for a woman to preach, seeing the Savior died for the woman as well as for the man? If the man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman Seeing he died for her also, is he not a whole savior instead of a half one? As those who hold it wrong for a woman to preach would seem to make it appear? Did not Mary first preach the risen savior and is not the doctrine of the resurrection the very climax of Christianity? Hangs not all our hope on this that as Paul argued? Then did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel, for she preached the resurrection of the crucified Son of God. But some will say that Mary did not expound the scripture, therefore she did not preach in the proper sense of the term. To this I reply, it may be that the term preach in those primitive times do not mean exactly what is now made to mean. Perhaps it was a great deal more simple then than it is now. If it were not... The unlearned fishermen could not have preached the gospel at all, as they had no learning. To this it may reply by those who are determined not to believe that it is right for a woman to preach, that the disciples, though they were fishermen are, and ignorant of letters too, were inspired to do so. To which I will reply that though they were inspired, yet that inspiration did not save them from showing their ignorance of letters and their ignorance of man's wisdom. This the multitude soon found out by listening to the remarks of envious priests. If then to preach the gospel by the gift of heaven comes by inspiration solely, is God straightened? Must God take off because it is Christian politicians overtly wearing their religiosity on their sleeves? You see, Trina Lee knew that we'd been there before. And there was a spirit that moved. And one day she got up and preached. And no one stopped her. This isn't the way all of us will do it. But this is a hope that as we envision village, we continue to listen to the spirit and the voice and the love of God so that we, do not imitate the wicked, but the good, and that is the good of God. Thank you.